Hey, good morning. We are so glad that you are joining us for the preaching of God's Word, and we just pray that God uses it in your life in an incredible way. Let me start off today with this story. There was once a man known as the town drunk who gave his heart completely to Jesus. He stopped drinking, told himself that the first church he came to was going to be his home church from now on every single Sunday. Determined to turn his life around, he found a church, he went in, and as he entered the doors, he was met by a couple ushers. They very quickly told him, they said, go home, clean up, take a bath, cut your hair, shave your beard, and then you can come back to church. Well, the man left and, and did everything they asked him to do, and he came back that very next Sunday. And once again, he was met at the door by the same two ushers. That's when he smiled really big and he said, guys, I've done everything that you've asked me to do. I'm clean. My, my hair is cut and combed. I'm, I'm clean shaven. I'm ready to come into the worship service. Well, the stern faced ushers looked the man over and said, that's good that you did those things, but your clothes are so dirty and torn up. Go get yourself a suit so you'll look nice and then come back next week. Well, the man was a little hurt by the comments at this point, but he decided that he wasn't going to get offended. He was going to do what they asked him to do. He really felt like this is the church he should come to. And so even though he didn't have much money, he scrounged around and he managed to get enough to buy a suit. And so the next Sunday, he came in looking spiffy, man. He looked good as anyone else. At this time, he was met at the door by the same two ushers and their legalistic preacher. Together, the three of them explained to the man that he could not come into the church service because of all he had done in his past. How would it look, they said, if the town drunk came to our church? Well, as you can imagine, he was totally dejected, couldn't take it anymore. He walked out the doors. He sat right there on the front steps, put his head in his hands, and he began to cry. And as he sat there, he began to feel this hand on his, on his shoulder. And before he could even look up, he heard a voice say, don't worry, my friend, I've been trying to get in that church for years and they won't let me in either. That's when the man looked up and he saw a man dressed in a white robe with nail pierced hands. See, even Jesus wanted in that church, but he wasn't welcome. Guys, I'm sure you realize that that story is, is fictional, but unfortunately, we've all heard real-life stories of church people acting the exact same way. And listen, I can't stand that because that's why so many people want nothing to do with church. And apparently, this isn't just an American problem. This was something that the first century Jewish church dealt with as well, and James felt like he had to address this issue. Now, I think it's fair to say that most of us would never do what they did in that story. But I think we'll be surprised as we allow the word of God to speak into our hearts, as we ask the word to be that mirror that we talked about last week. I think we'll be surprised by just how much maybe we do make judgments against different people for whatever reason, sometimes without even realizing it. So go ahead and grab your Bibles for me. Grab those for me. Turn to James chapter 2, James 2. As you're doing that, let's kind of get our arms around the book of James just a little bit better. The theme of this entire book, written by the brother of Jesus, known as James, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, the theme is spiritual maturity. Growing up in your faith and being mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's the ultimate goal that we'll probably never reach, but that's what we're aiming for. James is saying, church, you say you want revival. You say you want to see the church grow and, and truly impact the world. Well, that's not going to happen until we get out of these spiritual diapers and we get serious about following Jesus with all of our hearts. No more playing church. It's time to be completely committed followers of Jesus Christ, who not only can talk the talk, but who are more importantly all about walking the walk by the grace of God. So James opens up in chapter one that we looked at over the last three weeks, and he opens by talking about the trials. 
okay? And then he talks about temptations and then self-deception and how we can fall into all of these things and yet we can overcome them by the power of God. We can overcome it all and we can triumph if we will allow the word of God to be active in our hearts, in our lives. And chapter one was all about this theme of being patient in times of testing. And then here in chapter two, chapter two of James, we see this theme of practicing the truth. And James kicks off this chapter by showing us that our faith in God must show in how we love others. If it doesn't, then it's not real faith in our awesome God. And so go ahead, if you're taking notes, and don't forget that we have our outlines that you can download at fccgreensburg.com. Right there on the homepage, click on online services, click on the, the date you want to get to, and you'll see it right there. You can download that. If you're a big note taker, that may bless you and you may want to do that. If you're not, it's okay. First thing I want you to see today, the ground is level at the cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And I don't know about you, but man, I am so, so thankful that it is. Look at me here at James 2. Starting in verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, hey, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, we could have kept going probably to verse 7 because it kind of stresses the same thing, and I encourage you to read that on your own. But what I want us to understand is how God sees favoritism and discrimination. Because the reality is that he hates it. And Jesus spent his life on this earth trying to show us that God's arms are open to anyone who will sincerely seek his face, sincerely follow him every day for the rest of their life. See, he's talking about from royalty to middle class to the down and out, and even those who are despised in our society. And I even find it interesting that the religious leaders who were always trying to trap Jesus in his words, they even made this comment about Jesus in Matthew chapter 22. And I'm going to start here in Matthew 22, verse 15. I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. Here's what it says. Then the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. They sent some of their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to meet with him. Now listen to their words. Teacher, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. Listen to this. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Those were his enemies saying you are impartial and you don't play favorites. The very people who in the next chapter, Jesus actually just goes off on for looking down on others for being complete hypocrites who talked one way and lived another, and for being selfish and self-serving when they were honestly called by God to be selfless spiritual leaders. So listen, if you're looking for an interesting read, go to Matthew 23, read that chapter. I call it the Jesus is ticked off at phony religious people chapter. Uh, it really just Jesus just showing his heart towards that kind of behavior and those, those kind of, that kind of legalism. But even those who couldn't stand Jesus in those days couldn't help but acknowledge that he didn't play favorites. He even chose a man like Peter. And man, I think a lot of us can relate to him. He was blue collar, hard nosed, fly off the handle, bad temper, stick his foot in his mouth all the time type of guy. And he turned, God turned him into a rock, into a force for spreading the gospel. He even chose a man like Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. In those days, that job was one of the most despised, viewed right there with a prostitute because he was basically working for the Roman government that had overtaken the Jewish people. He was a traitor to his country, a Benedict Arnold in our eyes. 
And he used him to write the very first gospel we see in the New Testament. And when the Pharisees learned about the people that Jesus hung around, even the people that Jesus pursued, they said, why does Jesus eat with such sinners? And then on the other side of the equation, he even chose a man named Nathaniel, who Jesus called a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. A man who was deeply respected for following God and loving him all of his life. And he looked at this group of disciples just like he does us today. And he says, hey, I don't care what your social status is. I don't care if you're rich or you're poor. I don't care if you're somewhere in between. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. I don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, an independent, or even a communist. I don't care if you're morally upright or morally corrupt, whether you're white, black, brown, red, yellow, or purple. I don't care if you have an IQ of 60 or 160. I don't care if you've been a churchgoer for 100 years, for 50, for 20, or even three days, or maybe this is the first time you've tuned in to church online. I don't care, he says, whether you're in your 80s, your 60s, your 40s, your 20s, or you're a kid. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. That's what I love. I absolutely love that about our God. He allows all of us to walk to the foot of the cross carrying our sins, carrying our baggage, and you and I can kneel down right there, surrender everything to him, receive his grace, and next to us can be President Trump or former President Obama. Next to him can be a prostitute off the streets of Atlanta. Next to her can be a leader of Al-Qaeda. Next to him can be a tribal leader from Kenya, and next to him can be a seven-year-old girl from Argentina. And the best part is that every one of us, we can bring our transgressions and our mistakes before our holy God. And because he sent Jesus to take our place, to die in our place on the cross, we can confess our sins, we can repent, and we can be baptized into his forgiveness and his grace. And the transformation truly begins at that point. And it will last our entire lives. Because listen, the leader of Al-Qaeda won't be a terrorist anymore when he encounters the true love of Jesus. And we too, with all of our sins, we won't be the same as we surrender our life to him. See, in 2004, Erwin Lutzer put it like this. He said, it's been said that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all come as needy sinners. We all come with the same need for the pardon that God alone can give. So make sure you realize no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter who your mama is or your mama isn't, you can come to the cross today, whether for the first time or for the 10,000th time. And you can find that grace, that comfort, and that rest that your heart needs and longs for. See, In our passage in James, uh, he gives us this example of, of a rich man and a poor man and how some of the early churches were treating the rich man good, probably because he could benefit them in some way, but they could care less about the poor man. And one modern day example of this, I guess it's from a few years back, is a story that I've heard about a church called Bel Air Presbyterian Church in California. Apparently, Ronald and Nancy Reagan attended this church pretty often when he was the governor. And they usually sat in about the same seats, just off the center, about two-thirds the way back in the sanctuary. One particular Sunday, Mr. and Mrs. Reagan were a few minutes late, and when they got there, there were two college students who were unknowingly sitting in their seats. They had no idea that the Reagans went to the church. And Usher, seeing the governor coming, went down, asked the college students to move to the side, which they did, no problem, And then he took the Reagans down to be seated. And by the way, the Reagans knew nothing about this. Well, to his credit, the pastor saw all of this. He was seated on the stage. He got down. He walked over to those college students. And he said, listen, I am so sorry that just happened. As long as I am the pastor of this church, that will never, ever happen again. Guys, we live in a society that is all about who you are, who you know, 
where you've been, what you've accomplished, and the five best things that you can put on a resume. But listen, you have a God who loves you, a God who cares for you as much as he has anybody else who's ever walked this earth. The ground is level at the cross. Second point that I want us to chew on this week, your faith is clearly seen by how you love others. Your faith is clearly seen by how you love others. See, in God's eyes, which are really the only ones that matter, the ground is level. And so we have to love others who are different from us, and we have to see them through the eyes of Christ. And guys, I get it. I get it. This is hard to do. Every one of us struggle with this one. This one's tough. So go ahead, grab your Bibles again. Flip with me here to James chapter 2, and we're going to pick up here in verse 8. James 2, starting in verse 8. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Let's kind of break that down. We've kind of already covered the last part of that passage. We understand that every one of us have sinned against our God. And one sin, just one, separates us from a holy and perfect God who cannot stand. Our Father, Heavenly Father, cannot stand before sin. But he loved us so much that he made a way. And Jesus came and he died on the cross to take our place. And because of that, we all have the opportunity to lay our sins down at the cross and follow Jesus. That is called grace. But I want to narrow down here on verses 8 and 9 because in Luke chapter 10, we see the religious, religious leaders once again trying to dig up any dirt they possibly can on Jesus. So here comes one of their super intellectual leaders, and he says to Jesus, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus basically says, well, what does the word of God say? And the guy says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus basically says, well, that wasn't so hard, was it? Do that and you will live. But the guy has one more question. He says, but who is my neighbor? And that's when Jesus told him the story that we all know is the parable of the Good Samaritan. See, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was robbed and beaten and he was left for dead. A priest, a man of the cloth, as they say, happened to be going down the same road, saw the man decided not to show compassion, crossed over the other side of the road, and just walked on by, left him to die. A few minutes later, a Levite, a member of the priestly tribe, also went on by, no compassion, ignored the man, left him to die. But then came a Samaritan, and you have to understand the story here. Samaritans in the first century, Jews and Samaritans did not like each other. Jews looked down upon Samaritans. They saw them as half-breeds. I know that's racist and I don't agree with it, but that's just kind of how the, the atmosphere was in their culture. But this guy, this Samaritan, who was coming by in this story, he had the heart to stop, to show compassion, to pick the guy up, to put bandages on him. And then he took him and he paid for him to have shelter and medical attention. And then Jesus looked these Pharisees who represented the first two characters in this story. He looked them right in the eyes, these selfish men. And he said, which one of these three was really the neighbor to the man who had been beaten? The answer is obvious. It was the third guy, the Samaritan. And so here's my question for you. Who's your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? He's not talking just about your street address although those are neighbors too, Jesus is talking about anybody that God puts in your path, regardless of race 
or social status or political affiliation, regardless of how much money they have or don't have, regardless of appearance or reputation or past, regardless of age or, or whether they've been in church for a day or for 95 years, regardless of all those things, you can tell someone's faith by how they love and they treat their neighbor. Now do me a favor, perk up a little bit with me, okay? I can hear some of you snoring right through the screen. It's getting loud, all right? So wake up, freshen up, and let's get real practical with this passage over the next few minutes. I sat down at my, my desk and I was just trying to think of times when all of us have the tendency to show favoritism. And sometimes we don't even realize it. And the first area that James even talked about in our passage today is we show favoritism based on economic standing, based on how much money someone has or doesn't have. And I'm just going to be 100% real with you here. I have heard horror stories. You've probably heard them too from other churches where they made their decisions based on what people with money wanted to do. I've heard of wealthy people who basically came to the leaders and said, listen, if you don't do what I want you to do, I'm going to take my money and I'm going to leave. And guys, after reading this passage today, the church and its leaders have to say, listen, here's why we're making this decision. And if you have to leave because we won't make decisions for you because you have more money, then I guess that's what you got to do, okay? The church and its leaders must always focus on the mission of our church, which is to love God, love people, and make disciples for Jesus. Always make decisions based on where the Holy Spirit of God leads us and not because somebody threatens. We cannot show favoritism based on economic standing. We can't show it based on how much money somebody has. Now, second, we can't show favoritism based on giftedness, based on giftedness. One passage that the church talks about a lot is 1 Corinthians 13. I call this the love chapter. We, I, I read this about every wedding I do. But I think sometimes we overlook this chapter that comes right before it. Chapter 12 is all about the body of Christ and how God gives each one of us different gifts for a reason, according to his will, and he makes it clear, no matter where you serve in the church, it's just as important as where anyone else serves. So, no matter what you do, whether before this quarantine, maybe you served in our children's department, or our nursery, or with our youth, or as a greeter in the sound booth, maybe you uh, did uh, a food uh, for our holy grounds area, maybe you're a preacher, maybe you're a teacher, Every one of us is equally important in our Father's eyes, and every job is equally important. So don't fall into that trap of seeing some jobs as more important than others because the body is made up of many different parts, and all of us are necessary and important. Okay, third, I've noticed that all of us at times probably have the tendency to show favoritism based on appearance. Based on appearance. A while back, I was watching a TV show. It's called What Would You Do? You guys have probably seen this. It's that show where they put p these actors in public, and they're doing things that are crazy, that are obviously wrong, and they want to see how the public is going to respond to it. And so on this particular episode, they were showing this beautiful park. People are all over the place. There's these beautiful walking and running trails, and right there in sight, was a rough looking individual, got a handsaw, and he's trying to cut the chain off of a bike to steal it. And the people walking by were pretty adamant to do the right thing to stop the guy. Well, next, they put a very attractive lady. They kind of changed actors. They put this very attractive lady in that same role, stealing the bike with a handsaw. And instead of stopping her, people, especially the men, were stopping to ask if they could help her. And many of them were. It was amazing. It was really sad, actually, how people's response changed based on how the person looked. And you know what? I think if we're not careful, we can fall into the same trap. But listen to how God addressed this way back in the Old Testament days, about a thousand years before Jesus even walked this earth. During the, the reign of King Saul, 
a man who looked like a king did in those days. He was big and tall and, and tough, but unfortunately he wasn't godly. He wasn't leading the people the way that God had called him to. And so God finally got so sick of it, he sent his prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse to secretly anoint one of his sons as the next king over Israel. And so Samuel goes, Jesse brings out all of his sons. He's got a, a whole bunch of them, big, strong, kingly looking warriors that are proven in battle. And Samuel thinks, okay, man, one of the, these guys has to be the king. He falls into this trap of looking at them through his own eyes and, and, and through human appearance. But I want you to hear what God says to this prophet when he begins to go down that trap of basing it off of appearance. Here's what he says in 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And he goes on to select David, the, the one that his dad didn't bring in at first. He was the runt of the litter, the runt of the family who looked nothing like a king should or, or they thought they should in those days. But he would go on to be the best king Israel ever had, probably the best warrior as well. And you know, guys, I have met people in my life, if they walked into a church, would probably be stereotyped right away by their appearance. But I've known these people to love Jesus with all their heart, to follow him faithfully, to serve him, even sometimes more faithfully than some of the clean cut people that I've known. And then the last thing I want you to see, we can't show favoritism based on people's past, based on their past. Because the good news is, guys, we have a God who specializes in wiping the slate of our past clean, charting us a new future and a new hope. And all we have to do is open God's word. And it won't take long for us to find dozens of people with sketchy pasts that God transformed and used in awesome ways to turn this world right side up. So as we come to a close this morning, take those two truths home with you today. Chew on them and put them into practice. The ground is level at the foot of the cross and sincere faith is shown by how we love our neighbor, even when our neighbor may look and act differently than us. Let me be clear though, that doesn't mean that we stray from God's word. That doesn't mean we compromise the truth, but it does mean that we love as unconditionally as we can and we are loving people so we can shine Jesus into this world and see people come to know the grace that you and I walk in today. Let me leave you with verses 12 and 13 here in James chapter 2. Verses 12 and 13, James 2. It says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, the good news is that none of us will be doing the judging in the end. And I am so thankful for that because we shouldn't. Our God is, we will stand before our perfect God who can do no wrong, who is the perfect judge, and he is just and he is righteous and he is merciful and he is full of grace all at the same time. And we will answer for how we loved our neighbors, how we showed mercy. So church, I want to encourage you, keep loving at level ground. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it speaks to us every day. Thank you for how you've spoke, spoken to us today. And God, I just pray that we will be faithful to love at level ground, that we will realize that no matter where we've been or what we've done, that your grace is enough and that we will run to the cross and discover that hope that we can walk in every day. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for your word. And I pray that anyone watching this video who doesn't know your amazing grace will come to know you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give this simple invitation today. You know, 
maybe you have felt like you're too bad, you're too far gone, you've your past is too sketchy for you to be forgiven. I can't tell you how many of us have said, hey, if I walk into a church building whenever we can come back, if I walked in, the, the ceiling will fall in. Well, guess what? That ceiling is strong and it hasn't fallen in yet and it won't fall in on you. Uh, at least I hope not, or we got a structural problem. But, but hey, we just want to invite you today, if you are ready to surrender your life to Jesus, we are excited to help you in that process. Because of this quarantine, it's going to look a little differently than walking forward at church, but we invite you. Uh, you can call the church office, 812-663-8488. That's First Christian Church of Greensburg, 663-8488. Call us. We'd like to walk you through the scriptures, or you can email me at ray at fccgreensburg.com. That's ray at fccgreensburg.com. I'd love to, to work you through the scriptures, and we're going to get you baptized really soon. We're excited for what God is doing in your life. We pray that you have a wonderful week, and God bless you.